All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am Dave Reedmiller. I'm the director of the Climate Center at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. Uh, at GMRI, we pioneer collaborative solutions to global ocean challenges. Uh, and without a doubt, the foremost global ocean challenge of our time is climate change. Before introducing the series and today's speakers, um, I'd like to turn it over, I think, to Sophia to, to introduce Gateway Community Services and its Color of Climate program. Sophia, are you there? I am. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm having some camera problems, so I apologize for my not having my camera on. But thank you so much all for, for joining our last speaker series. My name is Sophia. I work with Gateway Community Services of Maine. We are a nonprofit organization in the Lewiston, Auburn, Greater Portland area. Um, serving the immigrant and refugee communities. Um, we have many youth programs, um, and one of the programs is the Color of Climate. Color of Climate was created in 2020 um, in response to, you know, Black Lives Matter and the protests and, you know, really re-envisioning a society that is just and fair. Um, and knowing that many, um, we don't have an, you know, a climate-led environmental justice, um, BIPOC-led organization or program in the state of Maine. So Color of Climate is the first um, really youth-centered um, space that we created. And, um, you know, we are doing many programs such as hiking and um, learning about what climate change is, how you can get involved in create leadership, et cetera. So again, thank you so much for joining all of us today. Thank you, Sophia. Um, so part of GMRI's climate-focused work is to support a network of regional peer communities of uh, teachers, informal educators, and librarians uh, as they work with youth to investigate locally compelling and, and relevant impacts of climate change. And that work was a natural fit with Gateway's uh, Color of Climate Coalition. And while that may sound simple enough, uh, early conversations with Gateway about the youth they serve revealed a much more complex perspective on climate change. These youth from families of origin across the globe naturally have a much more global perspective on what kinds of climate impacts might be considered local. Uh, and in listening to youth and to colleagues at Gateway, we came to see that questions about how climate change interacts with human migration globally is front and center for them. And thus was born the idea of a speaker series focused on this issue to allow educators and youth across the state to explore this topic further. And while violence remains a primary driver of displacement and migration around the world, today the focus of the conversation will be on the more climate-related drivers, though I suspect it won't be too much of a stretch to, to draw some connections. Um, I, um, uh, I apologize, my computer is kind of freezing up here a little bit. Um, but I also wanted to um, uh, kind of provide a little bit of a, uh, a recap um, of the series um, uh, to date. We've, we've hosted three prior uh, sessions in the inaugural presentation of the series back in March. We heard from Dr. A.R. Siders and Erica Bowen, um, who addressed many of the myths of managed retreat. Uh, and a key theme emerging from our discussions was the complexity of the issue and how it's yet one more stressor on communities that are already hard hit by a number of other stressors. And that the climate and social justice lens that needs to be applied to ensure equitable outcomes um, really did come into stark focus through that conversation. In April, we learned from Nadia Sitaram at Florida International University that varying risks and vulnerabilities to sea level rise over time may lead to different migration outcomes for coastal communities especially where climate adaptation and policy interventions are inadequate. And last month, we welcomed Dr. Alex DeSherbinen of the Climate School at Columbia University, who put the issue of climate migration into a global context, looking at voluntary and forced migration, displacement, resettlement, and seasonal movements from regions outside the United States. Today, in our final installment of this climate migration speaker series, we're honored to welcome Dr. Miyuki Hino and Fern Hickey, who will draw on experiences in American cities to discuss some of the challenges and opportunities that accompany climate-driven in-migration, measures that these communities have taken to respond to or prepare for it, 
and the policy changes that may be necessary to better support climate migrants in the communities poised to receive them. Dr. Hino is a, an assistant professor in the Department of City and Regional Planning and an adjunct assistant professor in the Environment, Ecology, and Energy program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her research aims to measure the social and economic impacts of climate hazards and analyze the effectiveness of climate change adaptation strategies. Recently, she has focused on the impacts of coastal flooding and land use policy, policy for, for climate change adaptation. Fern Hickey, um, who will be leading the presentation, is completing a master's degree in city and regional planning at UNC Chapel Hill, where her studies focus on climate change adaptation, hazard mitigation, and resilience planning. She comes to this work from a background in sustainable agriculture and community organizing and is committed to adaptation solutions that prioritize the needs, visions, and leadership of poor and working class BIPOC and immigrant communities. Yeah, I see some Tar Heel fans in the chat already, excellent. Um, with all that scene setting, uh, just a few logistical points. Uh, in a second, I'll be turning it over to, to Fern to give her remarks, which will be recorded. Uh, and Miyuki, like I said, will be joining us for the Q&A. Um, we'll have a general Q&A for, for all of our guests uh, to start with after Fern's remarks, but we'll then excuse those participants who are not uh, from the youth community to allow for a more youth-centric uh, conversation with our guests today. Uh, and of course, feel free to use the chat window throughout our time together. Uh, we'll be tracking it and bringing up questions or comments for our speakers at the end. So please join me in welcoming uh, Fern and Miyuki. Thank you all. Great, thanks so much, Dave. Um, and thanks to the Gulf of Maine Research Institute in general and Gateway Community Services um, and everybody who is here today. Um, I'm really excited to be here as part of this speaker series. Um, I had the chance to look back over some of the other presentations um, and yeah, was just, uh, really impressed and inspired by all that I saw there um, and am honored to be part of this conversation. Um, I am calling in today from my home in Durham, North Carolina, but I'm actually originally from Maine. I grew up in the mountains of Western Maine, so it feels really special to be able to connect and share my research um, with folks from a place that's so dear to my heart. Um, my presentation today, um, as Dave was saying, is going to focus on four communities in the U.S. that are on the receiving end of climate migration, um, and we're going to look at ways that climate and migration can impact local communities and things that can be done to build their capacity to accommodate and adapt to it. Uh, Dr. Hino advised my research on this topic, um, and as Dave mentioned, she's not going to be presenting today, but she is a wealth of information on all things adaptation related, um, and so she um, will probably jump in on the Q&A section of this portion uh, to be part of the conversation with us then. Um, and I'll say just briefly before I jump into things that I am like notoriously bad at multitasking on Zoom. And so if you put something in the chat, I did see the Tar Heels pride, um, but if you put something in the chat, I may or may not notice it. So feel free if you have kind of a more pressing question to just unmute yourself and, and jump in and ask it. Um, but otherwise we can come circle back around to any uh, questions or comments in the chat um, at the end. All right, um, so before I dive into talking about its specific implications for receiving communities, I wanted to start by talking really briefly about climate migration more broadly, because it's a term that encompasses a really wide range of people, movements, and drivers, and the variety of forms that it can take have different implications for how this migration is experienced and responded to on the receiving end. Uh, as this definition from the International Organization for Migration points out, climate migration can happen in response to sudden onset disasters like hurricanes or wildfire, but it also happens in response to slower onset progressive change in the environment like erosion or sea level rise. In some cases, the decision to move is undertaken as a proactive adaptation measure, um, but in other cases where people are obliged to leave suddenly in the face of life-threatening risks or disaster, it's more akin to involuntary displacement. And there's also a lot of gray area in between those two based on different climate contexts, but also the kind of socioeconomic conditions um, that 
affect people's choice and, and the voluntariness around these decisions. Um, as you can probably imagine though, people displaced suddenly and unexpectedly by a disaster arriving in mass and over a very short period of time, often having had no time to plan ahead for this move, are going to have a really different impact on a receiving community than the slow and steady influx of people that are making individual calculated decisions to migrate due to increasing climate stressors or climate risks. Climate migration can be temporary or permanent. Um, so many people displaced by climate hazards may ultimately return to their community of origin if that's an option, while others may resettle permanently in their new location or may even experience a series of moves following their initial displacement. Most movements happen internally, so within national borders um, and often to places that are relatively close by, especially in the case of disaster displacement. But as climate migration increases overall, the rate of international migration in response to this driver is also likely to increase. Though it's not alluded to in this definition, it's also worth noting that climate migrants include people from all corners of the globe, representing a wide range of cultural and socioeconomic identities. But like most climate impacts, the risk and experience of displacement disproportionately impacts people from historically marginalized communities due to legacies of institutionalized oppression and systematic disparities in access to resources and power that affect people's capacity to adapt in place, as well as the level of choice that people have around the act of relocation. So my own interest in climate migration, or even more broadly in human mobility in response to climate impacts, was initially sparked by a research project that I did for one of Dr. Hino's classes, actually, um, which was exploring the community-wide relocation of Alaskan native villages like Shishmaruf and Nutak, which are both pictured here where melting sea ice and permafrost and rapid rates of erosion have rendered their existing settlements increasingly uninhabitable. The bottom right photo here shows the first three buildings that went up in Murdovic, the site that residents of Nutak have been slowly relocating to over the course of a few years now. The act of moving in response to environmental change or stressors, whether undertaken as a community-wide relocation like this one, or as an individual or household level decision to move, is by no means a new phenomenon, but with the climate changing faster now than it has at any other point in the history of modern civilization, these types of climate induced movements are likely to happen with more frequency and at a greater scale in the decades to come. So as I began to pay more attention to news and to research regarding climate driven displacement, I started to wonder about the places where climate migrants are resettling and what, if anything, was being done on the receiving end to prepare for and accommodate them, as well as to adapt to the impacts that this migration would have at the local level. What I found as I dug a little deeper is that despite growing attention on the issue of climate migration more broadly, there's relatively little in the way of local action, much less state or federal policy, that's aimed at building the capacity of communities to prepare for and receive climate migrants. Active planning to prepare for climate and migration could help improve outcomes for migrants themselves, as well as for the existing residents in these communities. But as this headline from a recent Grist article indicates, even though climate migration is already underway, not much has been done to make sure that communities on the receiving end are ready for it. So through my research, I hope to contribute to a better understanding of the challenges and opportunities that accompany climate-driven in-migration, as well as the plans, policies, and programs that communities might implement to better prepare for it. I wanted to get a better sense of what communities are doing already in order to respond to and plan for this migration, and also to identify any barriers that are currently standing in the way of local level planning and preparation. To do this, I set out to identify communities that were actively grappling with this issue already, either because they had received an identifiable influx of climate displaced people, or because they'd been flagged as places that are likely to receive future climate migrants. From these, I ultimately chose four case study communities where I conducted a review of local planning documents, media coverage, and I interviewed planners, policymakers, researchers, and advocates who could provide insight on their community's experiences with and approaches to this migration. So the four communities that I looked at were Buffalo, New York, Cincinnati, Ohio, 
Orlando, Florida, and St. Tammany Parish, Louisiana. Um, all of these communities have really different experiences with and outlooks on climate driven and migration, which I'll elaborate on a little bit more in the next few slides. Um, but all four have been actively grappling with the reality or the prospect of it and have either adopted official planning recommendations or made public statements regarding their role as receiving communities. By exploring communities like these um, that have distinguished themselves in one way or another on the cutting edge of this emerging issue, I hope to be able to surface lessons and policy ideas that could be informative for other communities that are just beginning to think about it. So Buffalo and Cincinnati are both places that have been identified by researchers, local leaders, and the media as what some are calling climate havens or climate refuges. No place is immune to climate impacts, but researchers have pointed to places in the Midwest, Northeast, and parts of the interior West as places in the US that may fare better in a warming world due to their lack of exposure to sea level rise, as well as lower wildfire and hurricane risks and greater access to fresh, to fresh water. Um, particular attention has been given to former industrial cities across this region, many of which have the housing stock and infrastructure capacity to accommodate population, uh, populations that are much bigger than the ones they currently have due to decades of post-industrial economic decline and the population loss that that led to. For cities like these, climate-driven immigration could breathe new life into vacant buildings, spur economic development, grow the local tax base, and bring new people, ideas, and industries to otherwise shrinking cities. Buffalo has become somewhat of a poster child in the media for this prospect of an urban transition from Rust Belt city of the past to climate haven of the future. In 2018, the mayor of Buffalo, Mayor Byron Brown, saw an article in The Guardian introducing this idea that cities like Buffalo could serve as future climate havens. He took this idea and ran with it, announcing in his 2019 State of the City address that Buffalo would be a climate refuge city for centuries to come. Though in part conceived of as a way to attract new residents and businesses, this statement was also informed by local climate research, pointing to more moderate and manageable climate impacts compared to other parts of the country, as well as by the city's past experiences welcoming refugees and migrants. Buffalo is considered a preferred community by the Federal Office of Refugee Resettlement, and the city-run Office of New Americans has worked to continue enhancing their ability to welcome and support migrants since it opened in 2015. Buffalo also received a significant number of displaced Puerto Ricans in the wake of Hurricane Maria, um, an influx that is directly tied to climate impacts. However, despite this experience and the mayor's public statement, there have been no official policies or programs adopted that explicitly address climate migration. And a number of local researchers and community members have criticized city leadership for the lack of concrete action on this issue. Cincinnati, like Buffalo, saw significant population decline over the latter half of the 20th century. This trend has begun to shift over the past decade or so, but the current population is still far from what it, what it was at its peak in the 1950s. So they likewise have a housing and infrastructure capacity that was built to accommodate a larger population. Guided by leadership within their Office of Environment and Sustainability, Cincinnati has engaged in multiple efforts over the years to reduce carbon emissions and increase sustainability and climate resilience. These efforts earned them the distinction of being named the most sustainable city in the US, multiple years running by Site Selection Magazine. The city is seeking to leverage this reputation for sustainability and resilience to attract new businesses and residents. Their 2018 Green Cincinnati Plan, which is their, um, sustainable, their citywide sustainability plan, noted in migration as one of the anticipated impacts of climate change for the region. And the plan included a recommendation that the city prepare as a climate haven by working to provide affordable housing for climate displaced people and by continuing to cultivate their reputation as a safe location for businesses seeking to relocate from more hazardous parts of the country. The relocation from these so-called climate havens could provide a win-win solution for climate migrants seeking to reduce risk and cities and towns throughout the Rust Belt and beyond that are looking to attract new residents and businesses, 
The data on current migration patterns shows that people in the U.S. are actually more likely to move towards places of greater risk than away from them. It's likely that climate change will disrupt these existing patterns to some extent as places that people currently flock to along the coast or in more fire prone areas of the country become less hospitable due to sea level rise or increased wildfire risk. But given the many uncertainties associated with future climate change, it's very difficult to project exactly how it will alter population distribution. Um, and I think that's something that, that came up in some of the, the past presentations. Um, results of preliminary attempts to model the impact of sea level rise in particular on migration in the U.S. suggest that urban areas in the southeast and inland areas adjacent to the coast are the places that are most likely to see the greatest impact of sea level rise driven in migration, and that's represented by the darker red color on this map. This points to a potential mismatch between places that have been identified as potential climate havens versus the places where it's anticipated the majority of climate displaced people are likely to go based on existing migration pathways and factors like kinship ties and economic considerations. The other two communities I looked at, Orlando and St. Tammany, are places in this latter group. Both have already experienced influxes of climate displaced people and are likely to continue receiving more in the decades to come, despite facing their own considerable share of increasing climate risks. Orlando gained a reputation as a climate migrant receiving community almost overnight in the wake of Hurricane Maria, when tens of thousands of Puerto Rican evacuees poured into the city and surrounding Central Florida communities. Though Orlando grapples with their own fair share of extreme heat and hurricane impacts, its inland location makes it an attractive refuge for coastal residents of Florida, as well as for people fleeing neighboring islands in the Caribbean due to sea level rise and storm impacts. Orlando already had a fairly large Puerto Rican population prior to the storm, so community and kinship ties acted as major pull factors for evacuees. Orlando's large theme park and hospitality industry also offered a relative abundance of jobs as well as temporary housing options in hotels and motels. And as an established migrant destination with a large Hispanic population, the city also had pre-existing institutions and resources in place to support new residents, including the Hispanic Office for Local Assistance, which helps residents that speak English as a second language to access local services. All of these factors contributed to Orlando's attractiveness as a destination and to their ability to accommodate evacuees. But the magnitude and pace of the post-Maria influx was far more than they were prepared for and quickly overwhelmed available housing options and put a strain on other local services. This experience served as a wake-up call for city officials and opened their eyes to the likelihood of continued climate and migration. When the city's community action plan was updated in 2018, the plan acknowledged this likelihood and included a goal to develop permanent supportive housing for what they called climate refugees, which is a little bit of an inaccurate and kind of fraught term, but we could circle back around to that later. Um, the final case study community that I looked at is a little different from the others in that it's largely rural and suburban rather than urban, but I chose it because St. Tammany Parish, like Orlando, has experience absorbing a massive influx of hurricane evacuees, except in their case this was following Hurricane Katrina. As a coastal parish on the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain, St. Tammany experienced significant damages from Katrina, but they nonetheless hosted more evacuees than any other parish in Louisiana besides Jefferson Parish, which is just to the west of Orleans Parish. They've also seen continued in-migration in the years since, in the wake of other storms and flood events, as people from neighboring coastal communities have moved there, drawn by the parish's relative abundance of upland areas. The other reason that I was interested in looking at St. Tammany is because they're one of the parishes that's covered under the LA Safe Plan, which is a regional adaptation strategy covering six parishes in southeast coastal Louisiana. This plan lays out a framework that recommends migration from higher risk parts of the region to lower risk ones as one possible strategy for adaptation and identifies St. Tammany as a key migrant destination within that. The plan includes recommendations around preparing receiving communities to accommodate new residents while also protecting the parish's existing residents and communities. But as a non-binding regional strategy document, it's ultimately up to local officials to determine how many and which of these strategies to implement. 
So it was through my interviews with local stakeholders that I hope to find out what implementation of this recommendation and recommendations like it in the Orlando and Cincinnati plans have looked like, um, and to what extent further plans, programs, or policies have been developed in the time since. What I found through my interviews is that even these communities on the cutting edge of this issue are still in the early stages of understanding how it will impact their community and how to go about planning and preparing for it. Each of these communities are engaged in planning or policy efforts aimed at increasing local resilience to hazards or enhancing affordable housing stock, things that are directly related to building local capacity to receive. But the specific recommendations that they laid out regarding preparation for climate migrants haven't been implemented in concrete ways or in the specific ways that they laid out in those plans. And none of the communities have adopted further plans, policies, or programs explicitly designed to address or prepare for this migration. As one interviewee in Cincinnati pointed out, this is a field of work that's in its nascent stages. We're all still figuring it out. Nonetheless, the experiences and insights shared in these interviews revealed common challenges that communities will need to address to better prepare for climate migration, as well as factors that have inhibited or facilitated that preparation. Though the experiences of these communities differ in a variety of ways, common factors emerge regarding what it takes to build local capacity to receive. These factors can be grouped broadly under four primary categories physical and social infrastructure, local hazard resilience, external support, and planning capacity. Um, given our limited time here today, I'm not going to be able to speak to all of the factors that are mentioned here, but I will highlight one or two of them from each of the broader categories, and then I'm glad to talk further about any of the other ones in our Q&A based on what y'all are most interested in. So one of the questions that I asked in interviews with local stakeholders was about the challenges that they had either already experienced in receiving climate migrants or anticipated experiencing in the event, in the event of future in migration and what they would need to have in place to better address and prepare for those challenges. Respondents spoke to the need for expanded social services and mental health care resources, um, and particularly in the case of meeting the needs of people fleeing disaster. They also spoke to the need for increased language access and cultural competency across city agencies, as well as the need for community education and outreach to combat xenophobia and improve the local context of reception for migrants. The number one challenge identified, however, was ensuring the availability of housing stock and particularly affordable housing stock um, enough to be able to meet the needs of migrants and existing residents. Right now, there is less housing available for sale or rent in the US than any other time in the last 30 years. And this undersupply is particularly acute in the lower or more affordable end of the mar market. So this is driving a nationwide affordable housing crisis that impacts each of the communities that I looked at, despite differences in their local housing stock, property values, and population trajectories. This has implications for their ability to absorb and accommodate migrants, but it also raises concerns that climate migration itself will further exacerbate local, um, sorry, I'm gonna move something that got in the way. Is that blocking y'all's view? Can you see a little live transcription closed captioning thing that's popped up? Yes. Okay, oh, here we go. Now, all good now? There we go. Okay, um, uh, so this housing crisis um, and the way that it's impacting these communities has implications for their ability to absorb and accommodate migrants, but it also raises concerns that climate migration itself will further exacerbate local housing shortages and lead to displacement of existing low-income residents. In Orlando, which has seen steady in-migration and population growth for decades now, Adequate housing supply for the city's rapidly growing population was already an issue even prior to the influx of people following Maria. Many of the evacuees stayed at least temporarily with family or friends, while thousands more were put up in hotels and motels in and around Orlando with the help of FEMA funds. But even these temporary housing options were overwhelmed by the sheer scale of the demand, and many evacuees that initially landed in Orlando ended up having to move elsewhere in Florida or out of state in order to find housing. Mm -hmm. 
even in Buffalo and Cincinnati, which have been flagged as potential climate destinations in part due to their excess housing and infrastructure capacity. Local stakeholders still named housing as one of the biggest challenges that they would need to reckon with in order to prepare for climate and migration. References to excess capacity in these cities often gloss over realities of age and disrepair. One public sector respondent in Cincinnati pointed out that a vacant unit doesn't necessarily mean a habitable unit. This respondent went on to say that after decades of decline, the city's recent growth is raising issues of affordability and availability that the vacancy rate can hide. For example, a 2017 housing affordable affordability study for Hamilton County, which encompasses Cincinnati, found that there was a deficit of about 40,000 units affordable to the county's lowest income residents. Similar issues were raised in Buffalo, which has one of the oldest housing stocks in the country. With 64% of the city's housing stock built before 1940, one respondent there stated, we can't talk about having all this infrastructure and the capacity to receive climate migrants when we don't actually have the housing stock to accommodate them and be able to guarantee a certain level of quality and safety. The confluence of climate migration and the affordable housing crisis, combined with racial disparities and access to wealth and opportunity in our country, have also led to worries about various iterations of what some are calling climate gentrification. Respondents in Cincinnati and Buffalo raised concerns that their reputation as relative climate havens could disproportionately attract well-resourced migrants with the financial capacity to relocate proactively, as well as investors and real estate speculators who see the potential to profit from this anticipated migration. They feared that the resulting increases in home values and cost of living could lead to financial strain and displacement for existing low-income residents, and could ultimately render these climate destinations accessible only to those with a certain level of buying power and resources. Proactive measures to increase local housing stock and ensure adequate affordable housing are thus a critical element of preparing for climate driven in migration. The recommendation in Orlando's 2018 Community Action Plan to develop permanent supportive housing for climate migrants proposed the construction of tiny house villages as one way that the city might do this. I haven't actually found any evidence of this particular strategy being pursued yet but the city has recently modified its land development codes to allow for accessory dwelling units as one way to increase local housing stock. Some of the other strategies that were recommended by stakeholders throughout these communities included adopting greater protections for renters and the development of land banks and affordable housing land trusts as ways to try to expand and protect affordable housing options. Um, housing is, of course, just one of the elements of the physical and social infrastructure that communities will need to expand in order to prepare for climate migrants. Um, but in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to another area of focus that arose in interviews, which was the importance of enhancing local hazard resilience. So taking proactive measures to mitigate and adapt to local hazard risk was understood as a critical part of building local capacity to receive even in those communities that had been identified as so-called climate havens. A respondent from Buffalo spoke to the importance of really reckoning with and clarifying what it means to be a climate refuge city and emphasized that it doesn't mean that they're exempt from the impacts of climate change. Buffalo experiences flooding, snowstorms, and high wind events, and the city is projected to see rising temperatures, greater precipitation, and an increase in lake effect snow in the decades to come due to climate change. Cincinnati also struggles with the impacts of storms and flooding and anticipates that rising temperatures, more frequent drought, an increase in pest pressure, um, that all of these things will contribute to agricultural disruption and crop loss in the surrounding agricultural areas, which could in turn impact local food supply and economic activity in the region. Though they're both cooler than their Gulf South counterparts in this study, Cincinnati and Buffalo also anticipate an increase in extreme heat events in the decade to come, which have the potential to cause significant public health hazards due to lower access to air conditioning and other cooling infrastructure than is present in southern cities that are overall better equipped to manage this heat. Um, and in fact, I was just reading an article earlier today, I think from the Washington Post that was talking about um, over the past couple of weeks in Philly and Baltimore, 
a number of schools having to close early um, because of heat and because of not having um, the AC and cooling infrastructure necessary to um, keep kids safe um, and have a safe learning environment. Um, and so it doesn't just affect, it's not just public health impacts, but also the impacts on education and livelihood and the economy um, and this piece of the you know, it's not just about the, the climate itself and the climate impacts. There may be more extreme heat events further south, but the lack of infrastructure for it further north um, can make it just as much or even more so of an issue in some cases. So given that no place will be untouched by climate change, what may ultimately define a community as a climate haven, just as much if not more so than any innate climate advantages they possess, is the level and effectiveness of the adaptation and hazard mitigation measures that they're taking and the resources that they have available to leverage towards that. One other aspect of this that I'll just briefly touch on is that the growth and the development that results from climate and migration itself also has the potential to exacerbate local hazards and increase risk. Respondents in St. Tammany describe the current situation there as one where efforts to accommodate growth and court development have not been balanced with adequate measures to mitigate risk. Despite the recommendations in the LA Safe Plan around steering committee, around steering development towards low risk areas, interviewees shared that high demand for housing and a lack of strong development controls had resulted in new homes continuing to go up in the floodplain and being built to lower standards than are necessary to withstand the flood and wind impacts that they're likely to encounter there. This is a photo of a rapidly growing subdivision just outside of Slidell, which is a town on the eastern side of the parish. The subdivision is in the 100-year floodplain, and it's like well in it, not just on the edge, um, in an area that's susceptible to storm surge. And it sits right next to an old Katrina debris dump, um, which further compounds the environmental and public health risks that residents there are likely to face in the hurricane or other flooding event. But development doesn't have to come at the expense of resilience. Um, and multiple respondents throughout each of the four communities I looked at saw the prospect of climate and migration as yet another opportunity and justification for cities to approach growth differently, prioritizing sustainable hazard resilient and carbon neutral development, concentrating growth, growth in places of lower risk and preserving land that performs important ecosystem services like cooling effects or flood mitigation. But all of that comes at a cost and the expenditures that are necessary to mitigate local hazard risks and to expand and preserve affordable housing stock often go beyond what is possible for local budgets alone, which is why external support is another key factor in building local capacity to receive. Um, currently, there are federal funds that are available to support hazard mitigation planning and projects and to provide temporary assistance to individuals and communities that are directly impacted by disasters. But there's no federal funding or policy framework that's geared specifically towards helping communities build the capacity that's necessary to receive and accommodate people who have been displaced for climate related reasons. Stakeholders I interviewed for this study identified funding for receiving communities as a significant gap in current adaptation and, and mitigation spending. One frustrated respondent that I spoke to pointed out that federal and state governments currently spend far more money rebuilding in places of high risk than they do in funding the infrastructure and capacity that's necessary to receive and resettle people in places of lower risk. Respondents also spoke to the need for greater federal coordination around climate migration, not just funding, um, particularly in helping to match displaced people in search of new homes, whether temporary or permanent, with communities that have the housing, jobs, and services necessary to accommodate them. A public sector respondent in Orlando shared that she received countless calls in the months following Maria from companies and communities all throughout the country who had available jobs and housing and were encouraging her to send evacuees their way. She took down this information and tried to share it out as best she could, but as busy as she was managing the immediate needs of evacuees in Orlando, she didn't have the capacity to also manage all of this information or better leverage these connections. So federal research and coordination could better inform um, 
could help to identify potential receiving communities um, and better inform some of these decisions around post-disaster evacuation des destinations, but it could also inform the distribution of funds to communities in advance of migration in order to help build up the local capacity to receive. The final set of factors that emerged as influential in building local capacity to receive relate to local planning capacity, as well as some of the external resources and data that can enhance this capacity. One of these factors is the presence of local champions. People have flagged this issue as an important one and made it their mission to increase local understanding and preparation for its impacts. In Cincinnati and Orlando, this work has largely been led by leadership within their respective sustainability offices. Local researchers and advocates outside of the public sector have also helped to drive the work and contribute to local conversations around climate migration. But having the issue taken up by city staff has facilitated greater integration of these conversations and of these research findings into local level planning and has helped to maintain momentum around addressing and preparing for its impacts. Another factor that interviewees pointed to as having been key in building awareness and supporting local progress around this issue was participation in national and international peer learning networks. In the relative vacuum of guidance around preparing for climate migration, these networks can provide access to greater resources and information, as well as opportunities to learn from other cities that are addressing similar issues. One such network that was lifted up in the interviews for this project was the National League of Cities, which is an organization that's comprised of leaders from cities and towns throughout the US that are focused on improving quality of life for current and future residents. The NLC is increasingly including preparation for climate migration in their work with member cities. And they actually recently released a report on this that's called The Next American Migration, what local and state governments need to know about climate change and populations on the move. People that I interviewed in Cincinnati shared that the NLC has been a key partner to them in this work and has helped to push them in their thinking around climate migration. Through NLC, they have had opportunities to participate in multiple climate migration focused events, sharing their own experiences, but also learning from other communities within and beyond the NLC network. Through these forums, they're also connected to other peer networks and capacity building organizations like Welcoming America, which is a nonprofit organization that works with local governments and nonprofits in order to build more inclusive and welcoming communities. A couple other networks that were highlighted in interviews included the Urban Transitions Alliance, which is a global network of industrial legacies, legacy cities um, or Rust Belt cities um, here in the US and also there are some uh, across the globe as well within this network that are committed to realizing sustainable and inclusive urban transitions. Um, and both Buffalo and Cincinnati are part of that network. And then also the American Society for Adaptation Professionals, which has been engaged in research to better predict and prepare for climate-induced migration to New York State, as well as to the wider Great Lakes region. Given the limitations to current knowledge around climate migration and the lack of funding or staff capacity within many local governments to support research or planning around it, Participation in networks like these can play a critical role in increasing understanding of the issue and enhancing local capacity to plan for it. Um, so I'll wrap up by bringing it back to this figure. Uh, the elements that I highlighted today, which included expanding affordable housing stock, enhancing local resilience to climate impacts, um, the need for, federal for a federal framework around climate migration that includes funding for receiving communities, and the role of local champions and peer learning networks are just some of the factors that emerged in my research as key to building local capacity to receive climate migrants. Um, some other factors that came up in interviews included expanding social services and mental health care, enhancing cultural and language access to city services, and investing in education and outreach to combat xenophobia and improve the local context of reception. Um, stakeholders also spoke to the importance of regional collaboration around climate migration, um, which I think is true for you know, climate mitigation and climate adaptation in general, and, and no different in this case. Um, the need for improved climate migration data and projections in order to inform local planning, 
um, and the role that scenario planning can play in informing local policy and action around this issue, particularly given the high level of uncertainty and the current lack of data around this migration. So the last thing that I wanted to leave y'all with before we transition to the Q&A portion of our time today um, are some resources. Um, so the first one here is one that I already mentioned, um, but it was co-produced by the National League of Cities and Buy-In for a Better Buyout. Um, and it's a great place to start for anyone who's looking to learn more about climate migration in the US um, and also to see what different communities throughout the country are doing in response to it. They highlight a, a number of different places, um, ranging from you know, places that have been identified as potential climate havens or climate destinations to places that are already receiving a lot of um, evacuees or in migrants, um, but also dealing with a lot of climate stressors of their own, um, as well as looking at some communities um, that might be considered more like sending communities, um, places where that are seeing a lot more out migration than in migration um, in response to climate change. Um, the second resource, Welcoming Refugees in Rural Communities, is a toolkit and report put out by Welcoming America. Um, it doesn't deal specifically with climate migration, um, but I wanted to lift it up because it provides examples and strategies for receiving refugees and migrants that are tailored specifically to the context of rural communities um, as opposed to um, suburban or urban ones. Um, and then the American Society for Adaptation Professionals has a working group around climate migration and managed retreat. And so the page that's linked here will connect you to a variety of webinars and publications that they've put out on this topic, including some that are specific to receiving communities. And then finally, the Urban Institute has put out a series of policy briefings on climate migration, including this one here that's specifically geared towards state, tribal, and local governments. Um, but they're also currently leading research on climate migration and receiving communities in the Gulf South. Um, and some of their preliminary findings from this research are reported on um, in the last resource that's linked here um, called Why Cities Need to Prepare for Climate Migration. Um, so I can make sure to try and share these slides out later with, with Dave um, so that you've got access to those links. Um, but I myself have learned a lot from the organizations and publications that are here. Um, and so I also just wanted to give them a shout out for the significant role that these organizations and people within them are playing in advancing conversations and research and policy around this topic, both at a local and a federal level. Um, and with that, I think I'm done and we can transition to Q&A. Um, and I, I'm going to stop sharing right now, but I can jump back to slides if there's a particular question about one. Wonderful. Fern, thank you so much. Um, I suspect I, I speak for everyone here when I say that it was super enlightening to, to kind of see those, those case studies and to, to, if for those of us who have um, uh, kind of observed the, the prior three uh, installments in the series, it really provides a nice bookend um, to, to what we've heard about. Um, we do have uh, some time for q and I want to point folks to the, to the chat. Uh, Serge uh, uh, placed the, uh, the sea level rise viewer from NOAA in there for folks who are interested, would encourage you to poke around. It's a super interesting uh, um, uh, kind of tool to look at. And uh, Fern, I don't know if you can see Bill's question about um, whether there's funding exam uh, available and, and if there is examples uh, for communities to accept climate refugees. Can you comment on that or even uh, Dr. Hino? There may be. Um... But I, there isn't any that I know of off the top of my head. And I think that's one of the things, one of the reasons why federal funding around this is so important, because my guess is to the extent right now there isn't federal funding that's specifically available for this purpose. Um, there are, you know, kind of related funding streams federally, you know, like there's certainly federal funds that are available for working on local hazard mitigation and adaptation planning. Um, there's funds that are available, you know, there's funds to support uh, construction of affordable housing, but all of these are not, you know, directly related to um, building up capacity for uh, 
um, for climate migrants. And so they're, you know, kind of like indirect routes into that. Um, I will say that I know uh, through some of the networks that I mentioned, um, occasionally there are some funds. A lot of that is more just, you know, like peer learning and opportunities to have access to resources and information and to connect with other leaders in countries and in cities and towns throughout the country. But I think there, some of them do also have some funding pools available to support some planning work around this. Um, so I believe that Cincinnati, for example, um, got some funding from the National League of Cities um, that's, I, I believe they're using in order to support efforts to incorporate more um, community voice um, in the next iteration of their Green Cincinnati plan as a way to continue working towards um, building towards more equitable planning and equitable results around this. Um, so, you know, I think there's little streams like that, but there are none, you know, federally that are explicitly for this um, purpose. I don't know if um, Dr. Hino has anything to add on that. No, I think that was a perfect answer. Thanks. Um, Serge, we don't need to read directly from the uh, uh, from the chat window. So if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, Serge, uh, feel free if you're you're in a position to do so. If not, I'll, I'll read it for everyone's benefit in case those who can't see it. Uh, the question is, who and how uh, decides what cities are considered climate haven cities and what parameters do they use to make those decisions? Um, to answer that question, I'm going to actually bring my slides back up again for a second. So if you give me a minute and let me oh, scroll through a bit. Um, okay, so this is a, a, one of the um, resources that I mentioned. Um, the put out by the NLC, the next American migration, what cities should know about climate change and populations on the move. Um, that was co-authored by Anna Morandi and Kelly Main, who had previously written another kind of more academic focused um, article uh, called Vulnerable City, Recipient City or Climate Destination towards a typology of domestic climate migrant impacts in US cities. Um, so what they did in that article and what they've, you know, kind of further digested and presented out in the um, NLC report on this is kind of a framework or typology that really simplifies, you know, this is a, an immensely complex topic, and this really simplifies it down to three basic categories for how you might think about um, how climate, the, the combination of climate and population movement um, is unfolding in your community. And so the typology that they um, kind of propose, propose or suggest is vulnerable, vulnerable cities. So those are the cities that are like, you know, right on the coast, um, experiencing or anticipate anticipating increased flooding due to sea level rise or you know more intensifying storms places that are if they are not already seeing out migration based on climate change that may start to happen in the future um and so you know maybe miami is a a potential example of this not that they are seeing out migration right now but at some point that that may well happen. Um, and then recipient cities would be those cities like um, Orlando and St. Tammany Parish, places that are currently, you know, a lot of them might be along the coast. There's a number of cities in the southeast. So like Atlanta would be one, a number of places throughout Texas um, that are relatively close by to these more vulnerable places. Um, and they are because of that proximity, but also they're like, uh, you know, slightly less vulnerable position um, are receiving a number of um, climate migrants or evacuees right now, um, even though they face their own, you know, really present climate hazards, um, as well as other environmental or economic stressors. Um, and then climate destinations um, is the term that they use for what some people are calling climate havens or climate refuges. And so these are places with more manageable climate impacts, but certainly still experiencing climate impacts of their own. And this will increase in the years ahead. 
um, often have access to more abundant fresh water. Um, we've talked about the housing and infrastructure capacity. And also one piece of this is the desire to grow, um, that they actively want people to come in. Um, and so it, I would say it's not so much and when you say like who decides what makes a, a climate haven, or I like, I think you said climate heaven, which I also kind of like, <laughs> if only we all could have a climate heaven. <laughs> um, but what makes a climate haven, like I, I think that the media, you know, like has kind of caught on to the story and wants to like do exposés on like, here's the place that you should move in order to be like the most ideally situated. Um, and so I feel like there are people who are kind of like making these decisions, but it's not necessarily, you know, it may or may not be based on kind of real climate situation on the ground there. Um, and so I think this typology is more helpful in just kind of thinking through what sorts of impacts is, you, is your community experiencing. And then based on that, they have kind of some different recommendations that they say around here's, here's what you should be thinking about in relation to some of the specific challenges and opportunities that might come um, with any one of these different categories. Um, so yeah, I don't know, did, did that answer your question kind of? I think one thing, um, one thing to make, I just wanna make it totally clear here is that the typology itself and the names are, um, are ideas. <laughs> they're concepts, they're not um, based on um, actual information about flows of people. Um, they're not based necessarily on even um, you know, they're, they're based, I think, a little bit more so on perceptions of places that are hazardous or not hazardous more so than reality. Um, and, and also, I think a lot of dialogue around migration related to climate change in the media is based a lot more on ideas and models than on what we're actually seeing on the ground to date. Um, and so I think there is a lot of narrative here more so than, um, more so than kind of data-driven labeling that's happening. And, and the term climate haven is a really good example of how so much of this story about climate change and migration is really caught up in narrative at the moment, more so than um, kind of empirical evidence of what's happening on the ground. Yeah, and one thing I'll add to that too is um, the way that Anna Miranda and Kelly Main frame that typology is like this is a good like a good basis to use for scenario planning for thinking about kind of where do we think we fall within this spectrum um, and based on that you know what what should we be focusing on but they also pointed out that in some initial um, kind of like trying this out with leaders in different communities, a lot of people place themselves in multiple categories or see aspects, you know, one part of a community might be like more protected than another. So um, yeah, it's definitely not like, like straightforward or clear cut either. Great, thank you. Yeah, thorough, thorough answers. And I think it was a good question too. Um, let's go to, to Brady and then um, Nalita. Brady, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question in the chat? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Dave. And thank you for that presentation, Fern. That was great. My question is related to, well, I want to know if you, if you observed or heard of any regional or inter, intermunicipal cooperation related to preparing for climate migration or uh, addressing climate migration that was already happening. Um, and I specifically thinking of Orlando, because you mentioned both Orlando and Orange County, but really anywhere, if you saw like different municipalities working together to address the issue. I think if you ask this question about Orlando, the answer you would get would depend on who you talk to. <laughs> um, one person that I spoke with in Orlando spoke very highly of the amount of, um, and I'd say overall, there was a lot of cooperation across many different levels of government that came together around responding to, um, to the influx of evacuees at that point in time, because it was just, you know, the numbers were immense. And so it was certainly not something that the city of Orlando on its own could handle. And so the um, governor at the time declared a state of state of emergency. Is that what it's called? 
um, basically, even though this was a disaster that kind of had unfurled outside of their realm, because they're being so impacted by this immigration and had so many evacuees coming their way, um, he freed up a lot of um, state resources and funding through that the declaration of the state of emergency in order to be able to leverage funds towards responding to these needs. Um, and so I'd say there is, you know, like at the state level, and obviously a lot of federal funding came in as well through FEMA. Um, and so there's collaboration across many different levels of government um, and including between Orlando um, and Orange County. And I know that even prior to that, there's been um, the, actually, I think the same person um, spoke to collaboration around affordable housing and really trying to work on the um, kind of shortage of affordable housing in Orlando and in the surrounding area, um, even prior to that. Um, so I'd say there is a lot of collaboration. And I also heard from another person that I spoke with a lot of frustration and complaints around not necessarily the lack of coordination or collaboration, but the ways that our like government services and systems are set up that like people who lived, you know, who are maybe had landed in a place outside of Orlando City, weren't able to get access to the same, you know, services in Orlando um, as folks who are directly in Orlando because they were in Orange County. And um, so had different jurisdiction around kind of how those services were um, accessed and distributed. Um, and so that was another thing that came up through the interviews is the um, kind of effect of certain, um, particularly around social services or ben or like federal benefits, things that are um, uh, like administered on a state level basis that when there's, you know, interstate uh, migration because of disaster, that all of a sudden people may not have access to the same benefits that they were receiving or may have a disruption in those benefits, like whether it's, you know, food stamps or, um, Medicare, you know, so things like this that are administered on a on a state level basis. Um, and so th that was another piece of it, too, is not just the the coordination, but also the kind of the bureaucratic barriers that popped up in different ways, um, including around like licensing for, you know, nurses and and uh, you know, doctors and uh, teachers, uh, other licensed professionals who were, you know, coming from Puerto Rico and then hitting some barriers around trying to get jobs in Florida. Um, I'd say that there, there definitely has been recommendations around growing interlocal collaboration around this. Um, and, and I think there's some examples specific, like specifically around other forms of adaptation and mitigation planning that maybe could be leveraged further um, for that. Like there's, you know, a lot of places approach hazard mitigation planning at a, as a regional, like regionally across multiple municipalities or even multiple counties. Um, and so there is a framework for looking at that at a regional level. Um, and I'd say the um, LA SAFE, um, the plan that uh, St. Tammany is part of, is a good example of that kind of like more regional approach. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's an area where improvement in the amount of, in the regional approach and the amount of collaboration between um, neighboring jurisdictions could be really helpful. Thanks, Vern. Yeah, good, good question, Brady. Always good to try and find these efficiencies where we can. Um, Nalita, did you wanna unmute yourself? Sure, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Stephen. Did I change the last name correctly? I'm sorry, I'm very bad with last with names and last names. Um, just wonder if you could please elaborate a little bit more as we haven't talked about Quebec or Lake. I'm glad that you are from Maine, so I'm not sure if you are uh, close to Quebec or Lake. Um, so I'm wondering about, um, based on the uh, climate change and population, what is the current or the future risk for um, that specific area? 
in a, I'm assuming flooding will be one of them, but I'm not sure exactly. Fern, I think you're muted. Oops, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, I was having a hard time hearing that question. I don't know if anybody heard it better or Nalita, if you could um, repeat that. Sorry about that. No problem. Can you hear me what now? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I was um, asking um, if you can provide information about based on basically the climate change and population, what is the risk of a uh, Tibago Lake region, um, you know, for um, flooding or other uh, environmental factors? It's what it, what is the what of environmental regions? Environmental Sebago factors Lake. that might impact Sebago Lake. Okay, great. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, uh, I will have to pass this off to anybody else in the audience who is more connected to Maine because I, I am from Maine, but I haven't lived there in many, many years. So I feel less, um, less in touch with the specific uh, issues and impacts there. So I don't know if anybody else on the call can speak to that question. Sorry, Nalita. Uh, Nalita, I'll just say this is Dave Reedmiller. Um, so um, a, a couple of things. One, um, I was part of a, um, a recently awarded kind of uh, uh, kind of planning proposal from NOAA to explore the possibility of a new um, regional network that would focus on um, climate migration into kind of what they call the upper Northeast region, which basically spans incidentally from Buffalo um, across kind of Lake Ontario, the Adirondacks um, and then through Maine. Um, and so, so there, if, if you're interested in, in kind of um, uh, learning more about the, the group we've assembled, it's a, it's a really kind of um, uh, great consortium of about, uh, I don't know, 14 PIs across nine different um, organizations. And um, our work is just getting underway. And obviously one of the biggest challenges in, in this region in particular is thinking about our housing stock um, and its affordability and given the sort of attractiveness, um, particularly of places like Sebago Lake um, for um, migration out of the large urban centers of the, of the Northeast. Um, and, and one you know, kind of um, analog to look at um, is the, the, the COVID experience. And what that has sort of shown is that you know, when it's not planned for, things can go a little bit sideways or create some, some, some real challenges. But when we think about climate-induced displacement or migration, we certainly have an opportunity to do a little bit more forethought about this and think about, you know, um, housing stock, um, uh, support services, infrastructure needs, and things like that to basically accommodate that, the things that Fern laid out. And so I think that's going to be particularly the case around Sebago Lake as we think about um, increasing stressors on that system, both as a freshwater uh, source for the greater Portland area, but also as a place for, for recreation and desirable housing as well. So hopefully that, that adequately responded to your question, Nalita, but feel free to, to reach out or chat if there's um, uh, additional, uh, additional questions on that. Um, I believe uh, Emily had a question. Emily, do you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, hi. Um, thanks, Fern, for a really uh, amazing presentation that was super informative. Um, so I was wondering if you know um, if there are like other countries that are, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, do you know what other countries are doing to support climate migrants? Um, and are there any notable strategies or policies that you've discovered in your research um, that they have in place that we could maybe implement in the United States? Um, I might pass this off to Miyuki to see if she has more to say about this. Um, I did a little bit more when I first started looking into this, um, was looking a little bit more broadly and internationally as well. Um, but then as I dove in deeper to communities in the U.S., um, became much more focused there because it was a lot to, to manage as is. Um, but I think that there are some examples, and I, I feel like Miyuki might be able to speak better to those. Yeah, I think... Um... 
There are certainly some other approaches when you look around the world, I think, um, on the topic of international migrations, migration across across country borders. Um, I know that the Pacific Island states in particular have been um, really pushing um, pushing for more international collaboration on thinking about um, how in some of these most threatened island islands, people are likely to be um, leaving their countries or um, might be wanting options that are in totally different geographies. So I know that that conversation is ongoing. Um, there are certainly places that have taken really different approaches to the questions around like community relocation and post-disaster rebuilding. Um, one example, uh, there are examples, for instance, in Australia and New Zealand, um, where in the aftermath of uh, large disaster events, they have you know, relatively quickly and effectively compared to the US anyway, been able to resettle really large numbers of people in new places um, and prevent rebuilding in, in the same place as we do pretty often here. Um, and a lot of that comes down to questions around like bureaucratic flexibility, like how much, um, how, how quickly can the money be used in ways that's different from normal. Um, and in the US, we're not very good at that. We have a lot of rules. Um, and that makes it really hard to do things slightly differently when the needs arise. And in some of these other countries, they're able to be a little bit more flexible with how they respond. Um, and that can lead to these slightly unusual outcomes, like moving a lot of people um, relatively quickly. Um, you, you also see some places taking more of a community-centric approach to, um, to moving uh, large groups of people. Um, and uh, and having it be less about an individual decision and more of a group decision. Um, so you you, there's lots of different approaches being taken around the world. And I think what works is a combination of um, what's culturally appropriate uh, and what's desired by the, the local residents and these questions of governance and how does the public sector really help people and, and communities in different ways? How can they do that most effectively and most uh, quickly? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Vicky. Great question. Um, and I also would want to point out, I think it's Mr. Scott um, placed uh, some, some comments in the chat window about the work of IUCN and, and UNCHS um, on this uh, international work. So, um, so thank you for that. Um, um, I believe, let's see, who is the next question? Um, is it Izere? I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. I see here, sorry. Well, the question is, can this climate migrant issue have an opportunity or present an opportunity to work on at the same time uh, fight against the negative impacts of climate change? So is there an opportunity in climate migration um, to deal with other negative impacts of climate change? Yeah, I think the first things that I think of in relation to that are part of, I touched on a little bit already in thinking through how we approach the growth and development that might come with in migration um, for these reasons. Um, and so thinking about as people are coming in and specifically for those places that are, you know, actually wanting to actively, really for everyone, but for places that are actively wanting to court this um, migration as a way to kind of, you know, grow their population, um, bring in new businesses, grow their tax base, um, that that needs to also really be paired with a lot of thoughtfulness and good policy around um, land use and development ordinances to make sure that as they are growing um, in order to accommodate this in migration, they're not further exacerbating the whatever local hazards they already have. So they're not putting up, you know, more developments in the floodplain, which is not only putting, you know, the people in those developments at risk, but is also um, 
like decreasing the ability of the floodplain to serve the purpose that it's there for, which is to be able to absorb um, water and, and help to mitigate those flood impacts. Um, so I think on that end, there's thinking about how do we do development in a way um, that uh, mitigates uh, like climate impacts or climate risks as much as possible. And, and also, you know, too related to that is like, what kind of building are we doing? And, um, you know, how uh, thinking about the carbon emissions of um, those building footprints um, and incorporating more like energy efficiency into, you know, like for Buffalo, where they've got a lot of building stock, but it's all pretty old as they think about retrofitting that, how are they doing that in a way that's as energy efficient as possible? Um, and so that's on the receiving side. And then I think on the, if we're just thinking about migration more broadly or, or the movement of more of people more broadly, I think, you know, as Miyuki was speaking to you in, in response to the past question of like, when disaster hits and people are kind of forced by disaster out of these risky areas, are there ways that we can, you know, like as people are leaving riskier areas, make sure that people aren't moving back into them, um, so that the both for decreasing the risk to the potential to the people who would move back in, but also in terms of kind of reclaiming those spaces to be able to perform the the ecosystem services that they perform, um, and and kind of moving people out of out of greater risk. Um, but yeah, in terms of like actually fighting climate change itself, I think more of it would be around like, how are we approaching this development in a way that's as, you know, carbon neutral as possible. Great, thanks Vern. There was a, a, another question that came in. Um, how significant is the impact of investors purchasing affordable housing properties and flipping them to short-term rentals? What ordinances and policies protect such housing? And for a state like Maine of, uh, that's really heavily based on tourism, you know, our coastal region has lost access to, uh, it's estimated about 25% of the affordable houses to, um, in the coastal zone uh, to Airbnb. So can you, either of you kind of comment on that? Oof, that's a whole nother research topic. <laughs> um, I feel like, yeah, that's a much bigger question too, because it's, you know, not just in relation to this topic, but just in general, that clearly is having an impact on so many communities throughout the country um, in terms of their, uh, particularly in terms of affordable housing access. Um, I know that comes up for us a lot around here, particularly in the mountains. Um, I think the in terms of in relation to climate and migration specifically, this concern did come up, not necessarily so much specific to the short term rentals, but just this idea of like, um, you know, climate migration speculation. Um, and but really, it only came up in anecdotal ways. So in my conversations, particularly with folks in Buffalo and Cincinnati, um, many people mentioned, you know, there's lots of people who are coming in, um, and, you know, either flipping things or even more likely in this case right now, where they're not seeing huge amounts of in-migration yet, just coming in, buying things up and sitting on them, um, anticipating that there is going to be this, um, you know, influx at a certain date, and then they're going to cash in on that. And so it's, I think that's also like one of the reasons why, it feels important to me to be paying attention to this issue and for um, city leaders and community members to be thinking about it ahead of time because investors are thinking about it. Um, and so we wanna make sure that, um, you know, community leaders and policymakers are also thinking about it and putting policies in place that are gonna make sure that that doesn't down the road just land us in a place where all of a sudden these, you know, climate destinations are really unaffordable because all these investors and bankers have come in and, and bought up the available property when it was cheap. And then as people started moving in, they start to cash in on that. Um, but that is, you know, totally anecdotal. And so I think that's also another uh, area would be an interesting um, area for future research for folks to be looking into this, like what are the the trends that we're seeing and the impacts that we're seeing around 
um, real estate purchases, particularly in these places that have been kind of flagged as potential climate destinations. Great, thank you. Other questions, comments? We've got a few more minutes. If anybody has anything else, feel free to speak up. If not, um, I want to extend a, a huge thank you to, to Fern and, and Miyuki for, for joining us today. Um, this is the, the final installment in our climate migration speaker series, and I want to deeply thank all of our presenters throughout the, 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 the four months that we've been doing this. Uh, certainly our partners uh, at Gateway Community Services, the, the Color of Climate cohort, uh, and all of you who have attended uh, throughout these, these months. Um, it's been a, a truly enlightening series of conversations, and both from a technical uh, perspective, but also from a, from a sociocultural one as well. And I think uh, having an opportunity to kind of hit on both of those themes throughout these few months has been uh, particularly rewarding. And so we're, fortunately, we do have these uh, recordings, and uh, I will, uh, if, if Sarah doesn't get a chance to do it first, I will drop the, the link in the chat window about where you can uh, access all these. Um, and again, just a, a big thanks to everyone. Um, and please feel free to uh, reach out to, to any of us should you have uh, questions, comments, want to reach any of our speakers or, or otherwise connect in the future. Uh, and again, a big thanks to, to Fern and Miyuki uh, for today's uh, uh, presentation. Have a wonderful evening, everyone.